bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, uh, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be talking about Alberta tr Alberta's transition to adult care innovations. Uh, and before we get on to that, I did want to, right up front at this uh, session, mention uh, the CAFC conference, the 2018 CAFC annual conference, which is actually going to be in the hometown of some of our panelists today in Edmonton, Alberta, in October, uh, October 21st to the 23rd. Uh, you can go to our website. There's lots of information slowly getting put up on the website as we uh, fill the program and get ready to launch our registration. We did just close our poster submission uh, program last week. For those of you who did want to submit a poster, that unfortunately is closed now. Uh, but regist conference registration will be opening uh, in a few weeks, so uh, please do check back at the uh, website regularly for, uh, for registration and for updates to the program as they become available. And hopefully we'll see lots of you out there in Edmonton in October. All right, uh, so on with the presentation. Uh, we are really excited to bring our guests today to talk about their work in supporting children and families as they transition from pediatric to adult services, as this has been one of CAFC's areas of focus for the last five or six or maybe even seven years now. Uh, we've had a community of practice, one of our our, our three main communities of practice over those years was in a, a transition to adult services and many of today's presenters participated in contributed to and really led much of that work of the of the of that of our community of practice and it's great to see them incorporating all of their learnings and and uh, and lessons learned from that experience in the community of practice into some of the great work that they're going to present today so we can hear about what some of our members are doing to really make a difference in this area so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. We do have uh, quite a large panel, so I'll just go through some quick introductions. Uh, we have a group uh, both from, because this is a provincial program, where uh, it's great for us to have uh, people from across the province of Alberta. Uh, from the Calgary area, we have Dr. Susan Samuel, who is a pediatric nephrologist and clinician scientist at the Alberta Children's Hospital and the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute. We have Dr. Gina Dimitropoulos, who is a social worker and researcher at the Alberta Children's Hospital and the Research Institute. And we have Deb Tool, who is a social worker who coordinates the Well on Your Way in Transition program at uh, Alberta Children's Hospital, in, all in Calgary. And then up north in Edmonton, we have Karen Johnson, who's the nurse practitioner clinical lead for the Stollery Children's Hospital Transition Program. And we also have Dr. Andrew Mackey, who is a pediatric cardiologist at the Stollery Children's Hospital and is an associate professor at University of Alberta. And we also have joining us uh, a name that's familiar to many as she is, uh, participate, regularly participates as my co-host uh, on many of these webinars. And she's joining me again for today's presentation. We have Dr. Gail Andrew, uh, who is a pediatrician at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton and who has not only been a part of the CAFC's community of practice uh, in transitions but has also been uh, a big part of the work uh, that is going to be presented today. So I'm going to first hand it over to Dr. Gail Andrew in Edmonton to say a few words about uh, this work. Over to you, uh, Dr. Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of the background that kind of got this exciting work started. Uh, as Doug mentioned, in uh, January 2012, the CAFC established the community practice for transition from pediatric adult health care for youth with special health care needs. Uh, that was under the leadership of Lisa Strongquist, so I really want to give her a, a shout out for her strong leadership. And the population was broad with uh, medical complexity, developmental needs, and mental health conditions. 
And our community of practice members included clinicians, therapists of various training backgrounds, coordinators, managers running uh, current transition programs across Canada, researchers, and I think most importantly, we had caregivers and we had young adults who had completed their transition who really informed us about that, that journey that they had taken. Uh, we also had presentations at uh, our weekly, uh, our monthly meetings from uh, pilot projects and already established transition uh, programs across Canada and including the states with the GOT Transitions program. And we built a lot of camaraderie, but also a strength of knowledge through this process, uh, sharing information, current programs. Then we went into working groups to really drill down, review the lit current literature on transitions using degree principles. And then with that evidence, we uh, developed the Canadian guidelines that were published, <coughs> excuse me, in June 2016. And they're available on the CAFC website. There was 19 recommendations around person-centered clinical and system-based areas. And if you go on to the CAN, the Knowledge Exchange Network, we have, it's an active repository of tools developed for measuring transition readiness uh, and new tools, resources, and new programs are posted regularly. So after we did all that work, as okay, next steps. Guidelines are nice, but what about implementation? of the guidelines and then evaluation of the implementation to identify what are the successful elements. Looking at this as a quality improvement uh, strategy and also future research on tools and best practices. And this actually coincided with a perfect time in Alberta. Alberta has one health system, Alberta Health Services. And many of the members working in Alberta, as Doug mentioned, um, Karen Johnson, Deb Tool, and myself had, had worked on the initial guidelines. In Alberta, we have, um, it's called MINSI, the Maternal Neonatal Child Youth Strategic Clinical Network. So looking at, you know, establishing practices and pathways for care of that whole population. And into they identified the MINSI leadership, that transition was a priority. And as a result, there was rapid uptake of the Canadian guidelines to inform the transition work across Alberta. So that's resulted in we've got transition committees at all the major children's health care facilities at Alberta Children's at the Stollery here at the Glenners Rehab Hospital. And what the work we're going to talk about today is further research on adding to the knowledge about best practices in transition. Um, and this uh, group has been successful in it securing research funding to go forward. So it's pretty exciting for us to be able to present this good work today. So I think I'll turn it over to the Calgary team to start the presentation. Yeah, go ahead. In the, in the true spirit of collaboration across the province, we will be handing the virtual podium around the province for a bit. So we will go ahead. We can go ahead and get uh, started with the team from Calgary. If you want to just let us know who is speaking, because you do have quite a group down there, just sort of introduce yourselves, uh, just or let us know who it is that's speaking each time, and we'll, we'll progress that way. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gail and Doug. Um, and, uh, greetings to all who are listening across Canada. Um, in the room, thank you, Samuel, and... I'm Deb Thule. I'm the Adolescent Transition Coordinator here at the Children. And I'm Gina Dimitropoulos. I'm here at uh, ECH as well. Um, we're going to hand it over to our colleagues in Edmonton um, to start off with the first. Okay. Um, I'm Karen Johnston, nurse practitioner for the Stollery Hospital. And I'm the Lapo Ladley Project Manager at Stollery. So we're going to talk about um, our development of a transition website across the province. Um, next slide, please. So the background is uh, we started by having a small group of people at the Stollery, our steering committee, that adopted the um, CASI guidelines and determined that we needed a website. And fortunately, we had members from the Glen Rose Hospital who also wanted a website and had done some initial work. So it was very easy to move forward, contact um, the Children's Hospital in Calgary and uh, was able to get agreement very quickly that yes, we should all work together. So um, we then were sponsored by Mincy, as Gail mentioned, to take this forward and it's been um, really 
work in progress, but it's probably the best team that I've actually ever worked on for a project of this size. Next slide. So the key stakeholders are youth and families. Uh, first and foremost, if we don't provide what they need, we're not going to be successful. Uh, secondly, we need to involve uh, healthcare providers because no matter what we do, if healthcare providers are not giving the information, it won't work. Uh, we needed web IT because we don't have expertise in this area and the communication to bring this all forward. Next slide. So our provincial committee, as you can tell by this map, is quite vast. And so each zone is represented in each major city across Alberta. So we have four healthcare providers, nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, managers, educators, um, physicians. We have parents young adults from the Glen Rose Hospital, and two co-chairs. And that's actually worked very well because we have one from the Alberta Children's Hospital and one from the Stollery. So it does allow for the work to be split up very easily. Nobody's in control of it. Uh, we work together very, very well, and nobody's getting overwhelmed. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, this was a real grassroots approach. Um, we started small. I'm very much, uh, I know what I want. I want to get it done. Let's go now. And um, then we realized, okay, we needed a little more help. So by bringing in Mincy and other team members, we developed a product, project charter. Um, and that was to define the scope of the work and purpose and what we needed to actually deliver. And the work plan outlined what had to be done, who would be involved, and the timeline. So we developed working groups. Um, for both content development and review, website de design, marketing and evaluation. And basically, we just asked people to sign up for what they were interested in and where their interest and expertise lies. And that's worked very well. Um, we meet approximately one and a half hours per month uh, as a group. And we use SharePoint to house all of the documents. And everybody has access to those documents except for patients and families because it is an AHS program. Next slide. So we started off by engaging youth and families. We did the Transition Advisory Committee in Calgary, the Youth Advisory Committee in Edmonton. We had working groups for content, as explained earlier, and the Patient and Family Centered Care Network in Calgary, who provides their experiences, engages in consultations, and provides feedback on pediatric-related work. Next slide. So the work involved really the content development and review team, and then we looked at transition tools, not necessarily ones we developed all by ourselves, but what was currently available and that we could borrow, um, and had people review things like uh, videos and websites, and then we've got a website design team. Yeah. Next slide. One of the things I'm most excited about is we're really going to incorporate transition stories. And it is incredibly boring to sit in front of a computer and get information. It's very flat and not emotional. You know, you're not drawn to it. So by really telling stories about transition using youth and families, we can really target some key areas such as, say, moving out, you know, an adolescent with um, disability who wants to get his own place and how he actually accomplishes that. Uh, so we were lucky there's some digital storytelling workshops coming up, so we jumped on board with them, and we're very lucky because Mincy has agreed to uh, cover the travel expenses for uh, patients and families who will attend that. And that's really important for people out of town because it's very easy for people in Edmonton and Calgary to participate, but when you are from a small community, it's quite expensive for you. Next slide. So the user persona, uh, we developed some background information on who we thought might actually use this. And this is a really helpful concept because you need to keep in mind who's using this website. So, you know, we're trying to target this anywhere from 12 to 24 years of age. So we had Bob, who's a 50-year-old dad of a 14-year-old with CF, and they want to make sure that this kid can advocate, make decisions. And so they're going to go to the website for that kind of information. Where Joe is 17 years of age, so he's an older youth. He's not very independent yet, so his 
healthcare providers want him to work on that. But he's also going to have issues with things like going to university, um, being sexually active, uh, lots of information that needs to come for this type of age group. So these personas are something that kind of help us focus our energies on who we're developing this for. And you can imagine that um, developing a website from 12 to 24 years of age can be tricky because the issues are so different. And when you're talking about sexual health, say, you're writing for a very different group of people. Next slide, please. So the website that we're using is the Alberta Children's Hospital. It's currently available online if you want to look at it. And it has a lot of information. So it's currently up and running. So we've been giving our youth that website. It's not uh, provincial in nature at the moment, but there's a lot of really good information in the form of checklists and you know, find a physician. So things that currently are working. Next slide. Uh, and then this is our site map, and I did send this out separately, and I know this is small, but you can have a look at it, and we are very grateful to have any um, input that anybody has, or if you think we're missing anything, that would be great to hear from you. So what is circled in red are the things that we felt was missing from the current Calgary site, and in particular for parents, which um, there is a lot of parenting issues that can go around uh, children who have chronic disease, and also children with disability are at higher risk for, for say, sexual abuse. So we wanted to provide things that would help parents uh, teach and protect their children. Um, healthcare providers is another one. Not everybody is comfortable asking about mental health or uh, sexuality or lifestyle questions, so we're going to put resources on there about how to talk to adolescents and more information about transition in general. And we did want to bump up things like mental health and healthy living and other areas. So this uh, site was basically thought up by a youth uh, who helped us develop content in terms of what they would like to see in the format. So this wasn't just us coming up with it. We've really involved the families early on. Next slide. So in order to do a website content, we wanted to make sure it was comprehensive. I really hate going to a website and what you get is Pablo. You know, you can find that anywhere. So if a youth is going to the website and they want to ask questions about sexual health, I want there to be websites available for them that they can go to that will provide that information. Um, and so we've been very lucky to find uh, some really good websites in Alberta that are written for the youth that we can send them to. And so we're not trying to create everything ourselves. However, um, anything we are doing is developed by transition experts, youth, and parents. Next slide, please. So we do have a comprehensive review. So really the way this is going, this is our diagram of how we've mapped it out. Um, it is very helpful to have a visual uh, method of being able to look at your your track. I'm more of a just go, 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 get it done. But this has kind of reined me in and said, okay, we have a process that we need to follow. And when you're working with a large group, that is really helpful. So we have um, healthcare professionals who develop the material. It then goes to other healthcare professionals for review. Then it goes to plain language, goes back to the youth and families for review, comes back to the team, we alter it again, and then it goes to the website uh, development team. So once that is done, then it will go back to families and patients one more time for their final approval and that they're happy with how it looks and the content that's there. Next slide. We are using CASI guidelines, particularly to engage, educate, and build capacity of youth, their families regarding transition, and also the pediatric primary providers to assess youth readiness for adult care, identify gaps in skills and knowledge requiring intervention. So that's our big keys here. Next slide. So web site design. Um, so we do have dedicated resources from WebCom and IT. It is not, we want it to be easy to navigate. And things that I think are really important uh, is that you don't have to scroll and scroll and scroll to find something. We want, you know, accordion style, drop down menus, uh, particularly for youth with disability who may not have capacity to click. We want youth and family input and we need to have content before design. And this is probably where my brain wanted to implode 
because I wanted to see the website. I wanted to figure out what it was going to look like so I could figure out how best to kind of do these Lego blocks of information. And Webcom did not want to touch us until we had the content. So um, that part has been a bit frustrating for me, but, um, you know, we're working with them and working through this bit of an issue, but um, it's coming along. Next slide. So key features and functions, it has to be engaging. Um, if I put anybody to sleep on this website, I will have wasted my time and the time of everybody else involved. So we're really working hard on this. Easy to use, trustworthy, that the information we're giving is something of value. Um, comprehensive and mobile friendly, um, because most people nowadays have an iPhone or an iPad and want to use it on that. Next slide. Scrolling the website, like I mentioned, is not something we want to do, so we're really looking at opportunities. This is not our website. Uh, we did one trial mock-up uh, that everybody basically blew up um, the whole thing. So, you know, it's trial and error. You go with one idea and try and describe what you want, and then it comes back, and it's not quite anything what you had imagined. And so it is this back and forth process. And so we do want to have lots of graphics. We do want it, lots of photos, uh, content is centered, the users scroll through the information. So these are just two examples of uh, ones that we think, you know, might work. And I really like the one on the left versus the one on the right. The one on the right kind of makes me want to go to sleep right off the bat. Next slide. So what did we learn? We learned a lot. Um, it's beneficial to have a project structure, no matter how much I fought against that. This work takes a lot of time. Um, you really need to recognize that people are having to do this in addition to everything else that they're doing. So we needed to be very flexible with who could do what. We needed to start small and stay focused. So that's an issue, again, that I can have problems with. So I get very excited about things and can, you know, get off track. So we spent about two weeks on the idea of an app development and then realized um, we hadn't even gotten anything done on this website. And so we needed to pull back and focus on one thing. And, you know, Deb and Tina in Calgary are amazing at that kind of, you know, regrouping us. Um, it is about the youth and families. We need to make sure we're engaging with them that everybody has something to contribute. Uh, we really need to make sure everybody's voice is heard. So on our uh, development team, we do have a young adult who is with us as we're doing the meeting. So we also meet about every two weeks as the development team and go through information that um, we think is important. And then we you know, basically bounce it off her as to, is it important for youth and, and young adults? Is it worded in a way that you know, will be relevant for them. Um, and she has really good ideas, like, you know, we had information about medications, and she added, you know, one of the things you should probably add is don't share your medications, because I get asked all the time about that, and that's not something I had thought about. Um, it helps building professional networks. One of the real things that helped me, and this is also expanding thinking to a provincial level, is if I mention the word MINSPI in my emails to other people like Nutrition Services or Little Warriors who works with um, sexual abuse prevention in Alberta, uh, man, the doors would just fly open. It was like all of a sudden I was important and I was somebody worth spending time on. And so that in itself has been probably one of the biggest beneficial things for me is the things that I've been able to accomplish on a tight timeline. You know, I called nutrition services and said, I have two weeks to get this done. And they're like, holy smokes. And it was done, you know, with huge involvement of nutrition services looking at how this is so it can work. Next slide. Potential barriers. We had really no funding uh, or dedicated time. So everybody's working at the side of their desk. Uh, what's really positive, though, is that management has been incredibly supportive. So when we've contacted people, um, we brought on Heather, I think her last name is Lissell, from the Glenrose, because she had some important information we could use. Her manager immediately said, absolutely. And so that's very different from a lot of the programs I worked on, which is 
um, no, you know, no, you don't have the resources to do this. And so in previous projects, things have just fallen apart because the staff, you know, aren't allowed to work on these types of things. It could very easily have developed into a Calgary versus Edmonton. And again, I've been on where um, we both think, you know, that our program is the end all be all and we want to defend everything about it and think everything should be included. So sometimes these programs can implode because people aren't willing to share, aren't willing to give. It also could have been urban versus rural. So, you know, the fact that we have a lot more resources in Edmonton, especially for things like access to um, programs for disabled individuals, um, you know, we could have really struggled with, you know, including our smaller areas, and that hasn't happened. It really does help taking the temperature of the group. So about three weeks ago, we did that. Next slide. And enablers are like being one, being enthusiastic and a collaborative team. Uh, we had existing website content, early engagement of stakeholders, realistic timelines, and clearly defined roles and responsibilities. And these have all kind of helped us to stay on track. Next slide, please. All right, I'll move on to our next group. Or does the group have any questions? No, we're holding questions okay. till the end. Okay. Okay, so um, hi everyone. This is uh, Gina Dimitropoulos speaking. It is a real privilege for me to speak uh, on behalf of our our uh, team about uh, our qualitative work uh, prior to uh, launching our, uh, our trial. And I just want to begin by um, just uh, congratulating Karen on her excellent presentation and the work that uh, she and her team have done. And what I want to emphasize is that. Uh, here in Alberta, we, we all share some common goals, and that's that we um, really want to achieve successful transitions for, for young people to uh, um, achieve their desirable um, milestones. We're all looking to maximize lifelong functioning and potential for the, uh, the young people that we work with who have chronic health conditions. And thirdly, we're working towards improving the quality uh, providing a high quality, seamless, developmentally appropriate health healthcare services, and really making sure that the young people don't fall between the cracks during that interface between pediatric, pediatric and adult services. And, um, and here in the province, we're really working diligently to make sure that our services are rooted in evidence and best practice guidelines. So as many of you already know, there's a wealth of uh, really well uh, written uh, qualitative research studies on the perspectives of transition from the lens of uh, patients, caregivers, and providers. And uh, our work um, is really building on some of the, the great research that's already been done in this area. As I mentioned earlier, prior to um, launching our um, trial, we um, conducted a, um, a qualitative study to help us to better understand the Alberta context. And our objectives for our study was to understand the perceptions about the transition process to adult health care and to also obtain some perspectives on the role of a patient navigator for, for adolescents and young adults with chronic health conditions. So using a convenience uh, sample, we recruited 34 key stakeholders from across Alberta, um, from two uh, major cities and two rural areas. And our we were very excited. We have a very diverse uh, sample of uh, participants, um, including physicians, policymakers, um, uh, individuals from various disciplines, researchers, transition coordinators. So we learned a lot about some of the really innovative work that's happening across the province to help uh, support a successful transition. And the majority of our participants were on average 20, had on average 20 years or more experience in their, in their roles. So I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the findings that emerge from our qualitative analysis. And um, I, I think what you're, you're about to hear um, probably will resonate for you because it really echoes what we already know about some of the barriers and facilitators for a, a successful transition. We heard that uh, from the perspective of the key stakeholders that they really um, perceive that uh, there isn't enough 
uh, emphasis on how to best prepare young people for the, uh, the launch to adult services. And there is a real loss of a relationship, and not only for the, for the youth and the families, but also as practitioners working in this field, we, we experience a loss when we've been working with young people most of their life and their families when they, they exit our system. Um, we also heard about uh, poor communication um, across programs within pediatric care and then uh, even more uh, communication difficulties between pediatric and adult providers. We heard about long wait lists, which make the um, preparation for a transition to adult services really difficult because then you know that you're the young person that you're uh, that's about to leave your system is going, going to be placed on a very long wait list to get the services that they need. And that uh, adult services are often very fragmented and that uh, in contrast to pediatric care where sometimes um, youth can and their families can access all services within one institution when they go into the adult world, they will have to travel across you know, the city or the province to be able to get the um, specialized services that they need, making it really difficult. Um, I, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the facilitators. Uh, what we heard again is that pediatric and adult providers are willing to work together. And in fact, there's some really innovative work that's being done where teams are coming together from the different systems to really help support that transition. And that there's um, a lot of really great work that's happening where people have developed information packages, um, psychoeducation information, and have exit meetings with where they include the adult providers to help with that preparation. And we also heard that uh, pediatric providers um, are still willing to help with gaps uh, or challenges identified. And that could be seen as a barrier as well, but sometimes pediatric providers will hold on to young people longer because they know that there's nowhere to refer them out to. Okay, so thank you. So we'll hand it over to Dr. Mackey in Edmonton. Um, can you just, uh, hi there everyone, can you just move Forward. I don't think I was talking about this slide. Um, actually, well, I didn't realize I was talking about this slide. I'm sorry. Here we go. Yeah, there you so, um, uh, you know, the, qu the question of uh, uh, rigorous evaluation of transition interventions um, was uh, looked at in a Cochrane review published a couple of years ago. And um, the purpose of this review is to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions designed to improve the transition of care. And they um, examined randomized controlled trials, controlled before and after studies, and interrupted time series. Um, and include uh, studies that enrolled adolescents 12 to 19 years of age with any chronic condition requiring ongoing clinical care. Only four studies um, met the uh, rigorous uh, inclusion criteria of the systematic review, and these four studies only included 238 participants, and this um, uh, underscores the, the lack of uh, strong evidence base in terms of whether or not transition interventions are actively act, actually effective in, um, in achieving the goals that we wish to uh, achieve for our, our young, uh, young adults. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to briefly touch on each of the four studies that are included in this Cochrane review. The first was um, evaluation of a two-day um, transition preparation workshop for adolescents with spina bifida. It was conducted in the United States. They looked at subjective well-being, role mastery, self-care using um, existing scales. It was a small study. There were about 30 participants um, and uh, 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 30 participants in each group, an intervention group and a control group, and um, there was no measurable uh, impact uh, between these uh, two different groups, between intervention and control, uh, which is a bit of a disappointing finding. Um, the next study was a post-transfer support program versus usual care in young adults with diabetes. It was conducted in Australia, a very small study, total of 26 participants. Uh, they had uh, telephone support for up to a year, um, but this is again after uh, transfer from uh, pediatric to the adult setting. They evaluated engagement and retention in the adult service and hemoglobin A1C, uh, which is uh, a marker of uh, how well one's blood sugar is controlled. 
there was no difference in the primary outcome between um, groups, and that in fact the hemoglobin A1C was marginally higher, meaning less favorable in the uh, in the intervention group, although not statistically significant. Next slide, please. The third study included in this Cochrane review was um, an evaluation of a, a web-based and text-based uh, disease management intervention program um, for adolescents with either cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, or diabetes. It was conducted in the United States. There were a total of 81 participants. Um, and those in the intervention group had access to an algorithm that facilitated communication with uh, healthcare providers um, uh, when their symptoms became um, uh, uh, increased. And so uh, what they found was that, as one might um, expect, it did increase patient-initiated communications with the healthcare team when needed, um, which was uh, uh, seen as a, a good outcome, but it did not have uh, an impact on, um, on disease measures of control. Next slide, please. And the, the fourth uh, study uh, and the final one included in this Cochrane review um, was a study that was conducted in Edmonton um, evaluating one-on-one uh, -on -one education between a cardiology nurse and uh, 15 to 17 year olds with heart disease. Uh, there were 58 participants in that study uh, and the intervention uh, group received a one-hour teaching session with a cardiology nurse. Um, the usual care group or the control group um, did not receive any uh, teaching other than whatever their cardiologists may have uh, taught them during the clinic intervention, uh, during the clinic visit, I should say. Um, and uh, we followed participants for a period of six months. We measured their knowledge of their heart. And on the y-axis here, we have something called the My Heart Score, which is a congenital heart disease knowledge questionnaire. And on the x-axis, we have time um, with enrollment on the left, uh, one month after enrollment and six months over after enrollment, and the, the intervention groups in green and their knowledge scores increased um, uh, over time um, from enrollment to one month, and that knowledge was um, maintained at six months, whereas um, in the uh, usual care group in red, there was uh, no significant change in knowledge over time. Uh, we have changed slides, although that may not be apparent. So the next figure, sorry, if you can just go back. Uh, the next figure uh, is uh, um, on the y-axis is self-management score. So this is using the transition readiness assessment questionnaire. And um, when we measured uh, self-management, uh, it increased over time in the intervention group in green. Um, it also increased over time in the usual care group in red, and this um, underscores the importance of having a control group in transition studies, because if you measure self-management, we know that self-management increases with increasing age. So unless you actually have a control group, you don't know um, whether increasing self-management scores over time are due to just you know, increasing age or due to the actual intervention itself. And what we found in this uh, study was that the... Um, intervention group had uh, greater self-management uh, behaviors um, based on self-report, admittedly, at the six-month point. So this is the fourth study in the Cochrane Review, and uh, none of the studies in the Cochrane Review evaluated a transition navigator program. Uh, finally, I'll just briefly mention the Chapter 2 study, which is a fault of Chapter 1. It had a few important differences. It had a larger sample size, more than twice the size. We had two teaching sessions, one-on-one uh, -on -one between the cardiology nurse and the participant. These teaching sessions were about two months apart. The first session involved education about the heart, and the second one focused on uh, self-management skills. It was a two-center study conducted in Edmonton and Toronto. And um, this time, the primary outcome uh, wasn't based on questionnaires, such as the transition readiness assessment questionnaire, but it was actually timed to the first adult cardiology clinic visit where the time interval between the first adult appointment and the final pediatric appointment. Next slide, please. Um, and what we found is that uh, in the intervention group in blue, relative to the usual care group in, in red, that the uh, probability of attending their first adult appointment um, uh, in a, uh, was basically shorter um, in the intervention group. 
And the median time to first adult appointment was two months in the intervention group versus seven months in the, in the usual care group, and this reached statistical significance. The clinical significance of this is still to be determined, but basically what we found is that this uh, two sessions each in intervention got participants in the intervention group into uh, their adult clinic in, in a significantly more timely manner. Next slide, please. So that's it for my part. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so in this last segment of this um, webinar, um, we're going to discuss how all this uh, work, wonderful work and collaboration and um, coming together has led to us um, developing the Transition Navigator trial. Um, Gina talked about um, the uh, perceptions and challenges of transition to adult care in Alberta. Um, there was a nidus of work here already uh, with the AHS partners working together between Edmonton and Calgary. Andrew had, has now completed two of these clinical trials, which are rare in terms of uh, evidence behind uh, whether transition interventions work. And the slide that we skipped over um, basically showed that there are uh, there is a multitude of outcome data showing worsening disease control, for example, in diabetes and um, in kidney transplant and many other uh, clinical conditions, um, all pointed uh, to help us uh, develop the right question uh, uh, for this transition navigator trial and to develop an intervention, which is the patient navigator. Um, this was informed by extensive stakeholder input over several months and maybe even years. And um, we were able to do this with the right team members uh, here in AHS. Um, it really helped to have a single uh, unified healthcare system as well. So we're going to present what the trial is all about. Um, we're, the focus of the trial is really in the period after adaptation to adult care. Uh, sorry, dur period during adaptation to adult care and after transfer. And um, the figure here shows um, a, a, an individual who will say is the patient navigator. And the question is, what will this navigator do? Um, and in this slide, we have summarized um, all uh, the potential tasks that we have envisioned a navigator can help with to ease the transition from pediatric to adult care. Um, th these modules were developed within our team with extensive stakeholders and using the pre-trial interviews that we, uh, uh, that we showed you uh, a few slides ago. Um, so the first set of tasks will, the navigator will undertake is in preparation to complete the uh, assessments uh, for readiness of transfer, develop a transition, uh, in particular a navigational plan, assist in creating medical passports, and to meet and uh, greet with the care providers that would be involved. This is not to replace the great pediatric care uh, that uh, has been provided to the patient uh, in terms of transition, but really to pick up where the pediatric uh, care providers will leave off. The next major uh, um, uh, category is systems brokering, and the major role for the navigator will be to collaborate with pediatric and adult providers and advocate with and for the patient in the adult care system. A large part of the navigator's work will involve self-management. Um, this does include uh, a large uh, amount of coaching and planning for crisis management and really helping uh, the youth uh, to uh, develop autonomy and independence. There will be some element of tracking, medications, uh, refills, and lab tests, uh, where it's critical that um, these continue uh, for the health of the patient. The navigator will also assist with socioeconomic determinants of health. Uh, we've gotten feedback from our adult providers that many patients come without their necessary paperwork to uh, continue insurance for medications and, um, uh, and funding and so on. So this is an area the navigator uh, will assist with. So we designed this trial. It's called a Transition Navigator Trial, TNT for short. It's an explosive title. Um, the, it is a pragmatic randomized control trial. It is situated in real uh, healthcare settings, as is uh, other trials, but less um, uh, prescriptive 
um, uh, because it's it, it's definitely more in the pragmatic zone. Um, we are looking uh, to recruit approximately 600 patients. Our goal is to evaluate the effectiveness of a, a patient navigator service to understand the perceptions uh, of the role of the navigator. We will also be interviewing patients and families who are uh, assigned to the navigator arm. And uh, in the end, we will be doing a cost analysis to see um, the difference in costs between the navigator and control group in terms of healthcare costs. And the schema in the bottom shows a very simple randomization scheme at the patient level, dividing the patients into control and navigator groups and the outcomes being healthcare utilization. The primary outcome we're looking at is emergency room visits. We'll also be measuring all other um, health service utilization. We're also systematically measuring transition readiness and patient reported health status measures. Who is eligible for the trial? Um, patients who are between 16 and 21 years of age who have had a chronic condition for greater than three months in duration. These are typically lifelong or conditions that affect multiple organ systems and they are uh, being prepared for transfer to adult care. And the last pediatric visit has to be within 12 months of us um, enrolling uh, the patient. Um, we, we are excluding patients who are in a, another transition study, which may create contamination uh, in both directions or students who are moving out of Alberta. And this has uh, come up uh, in the screening several times already. Um, patients who are not residents of Alberta uh, will be excluded because we will not be able to track them using their personal health care numbers uh, within Alberta data. And if they're not anticipated to transfer, we'll have to exclude them in, uh, during the period of the trial. Who is uh, participating? Um, there are three major hospitals uh, in Alberta um, looking after pediatric patients, um, the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, Stollery Children's Hospital, and Alberta Children's Hospital. This is a, these are uh, names of clinics from which we're recruiting. Uh, so the most important thing to recognize here is that this is a multidisciplinary uh, and also cross-discipline study and not unique to one uh, patient population. So the recruitment criteria is broad. Um, we have started enrolling as of uh, January 2018. Um, we apologize for the, the formatting of this slide, but um, you can see that um, we are planning recruitment and randomization for another uh, approximately two years. Uh, the patient will uh, receive the intervention um, uh, for two years, um, but to accommodate the last patients uh, being enrolled in the study, the study will be open uh, with the intervention for longer than that. We're conducting baseline interviews for the intervention group and we will also uh, conduct end of study interviews for the intervention group. We'll convene stake, uh, stakeholder focus groups at the end to uh, really understand if the navigator intervention worked, why it worked, if it didn't work, why it didn't work. So we'll have a wealth of qualitative data as well as quantitative data from health service utilization. Um, and then we hope to be able to share our results with you um, closer to 2022. Uh, um, this is our recruitment um, diagram so far. Between Edmonton and Calgary, we have um, screened 72 uh, participants uh, because of the varying um, nature of, um, uh, of participants uh, uh, rolling in and, and us being able to contact them and the time delay to consent or exclusion. Um, we um, have now completed screen for 25 patients and five have been excluded. Um, the remainder are still in process, so they're not shown here. Um, and we have enrolled 15 patients of which 10 have been assigned to the navigator arm and five to usual care. And yes, it is a randomized control trial and uh, um, the um, stratification is based on clinic, 
Um, so you will see some um, uneven distribution um, in the beginning. Just It just depends on uh, which clinic the patient was assigned to in the randomization screen, uh, screen so uh, scheme, and that's why you see this difference. So um, we'll end it there and uh, say we have some generic emails for which you can contact us. This can be for the patients and for any stakeholders um, across the country who might be interested in talking to us. TNT at ucalvary.ca is the Calgary address and TN trial at ualberta.ca is how you can get a hold of the Edmonton team. And um, please feel free to get in touch at any time and we're happy to uh, provide further information. Um, we want to thank the large number of people that were involved in bringing this study uh, to its current state. Um, I want to thank all my co-investigators um, across Alberta. Um, they are listed here on the screen as well as um, the, uh, the great and tremendous support from Dr. Mackey and Dr. Dimitropoulos, without whom we couldn't have really pulled this together. Um, the, uh, some of the uh, AHS partners are listed here. Um, again, we mentioned the great collaboration that went on between Calgary and Edmonton, um, and that is still continuing. We're happy to see that. Um, and the inaugural patient navigators who've become uh, key team members, uh, Kristen Ting in Edmonton and Jennifer Schroeder um, in Calgary. We've been funded generously from the two foundations, Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, as well as the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation. Um, the Alberta Health Services MinC Strategic Clinical Network provided a large amount of funding for the study as well as now a recent grant from CIHR. So we're grateful for that. Um, with that, we're happy to take any questions um, and um, we will leave it there. Thank you for this opportunity. All right, well, thank you very much for a great and certainly comprehensive presentation. You certainly covered a lot of ground, a lot of research uh, presented here and a lot of great work that uh, we're certainly looking forward to seeing the outcomes of perhaps another webinar in the future when this uh, TNT study is uh, finished. We'd certainly love to hear the outcome of that. Um, so as uh, they mentioned, please do type your questions into the question box if you do have any questions or comments uh, for, our, uh, for our panelists. Um, one of the questions that uh, came in early on sort of was, well, actually, it wasn't that early on. It was, it was during the, the second half of the presentation. But when you, when you made the comment about the adult centers are interested in sort of collaborating or connecting, you know, a lot of the research studies when you were showing the participants, it was just the, the you know, the two children's hospitals and Glen Rose uh, that were participating, Glen Rose being not just a pediatric facility, but you know, that's what the challenge, we heard that when CAFC was starting our community of practice was, well, we're all pediatric centers in the room and we think transition is important, but there are no adult centers here to agree or disagree with whether it's important or to participate in the work. So we're just wondering what it looked like as far as uh, sort of reaching out to adult centers that would be on the receiving end of this transition process and what that partnership looked like, what were some of the things that enabled it or what were some of the barriers to sort of that re that relationship with the adult hospitals? I mean, Glen Rose aside, being a little bit different in that they have the pediatric and adult components, so maybe perhaps that was a little bit easier, but uh, I'm not sure who to direct this sp specific question to, but if any of you have any comment about what that sort of process of reaching out to the, to the adult centers and what that relationship looked like, if you have any comments on that, I think people would like to hear that. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump on that one because in our uh, room right here, we actually have adult representation from the Edmonton K Clinic. And you cannot do transition without involving your counterparts because there's so many reasons, you know, why we struggle with transition. And some of it, I think, is we think we do such a great job on the pediatric end um, that we don't really somehow have insight into things that we need to improve as well and not just inform um, adults. So part of it is just asking, and I've been really blessed with being able to get our adult counterparts on very early, and they come to most of our meetings. Susan is here. Do you want to address that at all? Do you have any comments? No, she's, I mean, saying, she's saying, no, no, we just love working with you so much. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, it is important. It is important that we both be involved. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Any other comments from our presenters? 
So from the Calgary side, we can um, we can say how um, delighted we are um, to now be making inroads into the adult uh, hospital. We had trouble when we were developing the trial to um, engage the broader audience at, um, in, within the adult hospital, but we had some key stakeholders, like the Department Head of Emergency Medicine, who's been incredibly supportive of Dr. Eddie Lang. But I just want to tell you one quick story. Our first patient in the trial um, back to West Transition, and um, within about four months after transfer, he passed away um, in the foothills ICU. And our transition um, uh, navigator became an invaluable partner um, in this child's journey, eventually to his passing. And that was noted by all the colleagues at Foothills, the, the clinical team, and we were given feedback that was uh, very much needed. This poor child did not have family members who were supported. So I'm, I'm just, um, uh, it just brought it all home to us. And this first patient who was actually a pilot patient went through the, the study and was able to provide an intervention that made a huge difference for him at the end of his life. And now the adult colleague will be making note and partnering with us. All right. Well, thank you for that comment. I just wanted to mention that there was a bit of background noise during during your comment. I think we got the the, the general gist of what you were saying, but there you were cutting in a little bit in and out. I'm not sure where the where the background noise was. It sounded like hallway conversations or something or overhead pages. I'm not sure. But uh, if the, if the other folks, uh, when when we're get, giving answers, if we could get just get you to mute, uh, that would be uh, that would certainly be appreciated. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. I mean, certainly an issue, you know, and, and very important, as you said, and it's great that you have those, uh, those, those adult centers uh, willing to partner as, as it seems that you do. Uh, one of the questions that came in from, uh, Lisa was, uh, she's asking, what is the typical prof professional designation of your current patient navigators? Are they typically nurses? Are they from across the spectrum of professional backgrounds? Does, does the professional background matter? Uh, Andrew or Karen, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure, it's Andrew here. So our, our patient navigators are uh, social workers um, and uh, uh, both uh, Jennifer in Calgary and Kristen in, uh, in Edmonton are experienced, uh, are experienced social workers who have uh, uh, worked with um, adolescents and young adults uh, in the past and uh, were already employed with Alberta Health Services when they uh, in the clinical setting, so as as medical background social workers uh, before they joined our team. Great. Um, the next question came in. Someone from Alberta is wondering if uh, saying they she may have missed it, but uh, wondering when the provincial transition website is due to roll out, or is it already available? Uh, no, we're about 50% of the way through developing content and um, in the process of going through the review on that material. So we're hoping for, we are on track, um, we're hoping early 2019 to be able to bring this forward. So we're hoping to be able to come back and actually, um, you know, show what it looks like. I know it's hard to give a presentation on something that, you know, I can't hand you right now, but um, it will be coming. Stay tuned. Um, Kristen's asking um, just about the role, just some clarification around the specific role that the navigator plays. Uh, she's just wondering about whether or not, or I just wanted to be clear that the navigator won't be initiating contact prior to the actual transfer. Rather, they'll be they'll start contact or support once the youth has landed in the adult world, or does that start beforehand? It starts before, so, um, so we have a process where uh, consent of form comes into the study team that serves as the referral. The study team uh, does the preliminary assessment, and if consented, the patient is randomized. Once the patient is randomized to the navigator intervention, um, they will go on to uh, be connected with uh, Jennifer or Kristen. And uh, either, depending on the city, they will meet one of the navigators, um, uh, hopefully in-house or by phone, and all the preparatory work will be done in the pediatric setting, and the navigator will follow the patient 
um, into uh, the adult side. All right. Uh, we just have two more questions. We are uh, at the end of our, our hour, but we have just two more questions. So I'll try and squeeze those in if we can before we wrap up. Um, the, this next question is coming from Justina, who is a medical student as well as a former pediatric patient and current adult patient who had a rough transition in care back in 2014 when she moved away for university in Ontario. She's currently working on building a provincial strategy in Ontario for transition in, uh, in chronic pain care. Her question for the entire Alberta team is she's originally from Yellowknife and was wondering if you uh, can speak to what your plans are for transition for pediatric patients who are treated within your institutions from rural communities, such as Yellowknife. She has many friends and family who frequently travel uh, to Edmonton with their children to receive specialized care. So what's wh those, those children, and particularly for those, uh, for, for Stollery Children's Hospital in Glenrose, receiving patients from the Northwest Territories and lots of remote communities, many of our children's hospitals do uh, work with those uh, those communities. What are your thoughts around the travel that's required for uh, for for transitioning pediatric patients into these remote uh, uh, areas? I, th I think this question would be best served by Deb Sewell in Calgary because they do a lot of outreach as well. Um, but that is something that is, that's a huge barrier for people. So I um, this is Deb Sewell from Calgary. I, I think one of the things that's well, I, I'm hoping that the development of a, a provincial website is going to provide some information to youth and families that, you know, 24-7 and even when they leave the province. Um, I, I think encouraging pediatric providers to do a lot of that preparatory work and ensuring that there is um, providers in the, the other province or when they're going back to their rural communities, ensuring that they get attached the appropriate providers um, wherever it is that they're going when they're leaving here. Um, I, I don't know from the transition navigator trial if the, if they're going to be addressing that. But do you want to? Yes. Add anything, so, Susan. So the um, navigators are um, also mandated to us uh, to work with rural patients. Um, a lot of this uh, work is done virtually. Um, so all patients in Alberta, if they have been connected. Tertiary Care Center, one of the three, they're eligible to uh, be assessed for this intervention. Right. And thank you very much for that. And, and I, I think with that, I think we'll wrap up the questions. I did want to go over to uh, Dr. Gail Andrew, just for you know any any sort of key messages that you'd like to share, uh, you know, from your position at the Glen Rose and being a part of the CAFC transition community practice and seeing this work at a, or being a part of this work, did you, anything, anything you'd like to add before we wrap up, uh, Gail? Well, I guess it's uh, just to stay tuned uh, because what else is happening in Alberta? We've talked a lot about the medical transition, the importance of engaging with the adult healthcare providers. But one of the other aspects of transition is the social transition of kids with complex needs. Because you, if you ask the young adults what their goals are, their goals are independent living, employability, edu further education, and actually community pr participation. So we are uh, currently in just starting year one of a grant funded by Kids Brain Health and, uh, and other um, funders to look at that aspect, the supports and services within all of our communities that provide as well as health support, but that social support for caregivers and youth and young adults. Uh, and it's not just at the transition time of adults, but across the lifespan. So we are actually looking at identifying gaps in supports and services and also existing strengths and bringing more collaborative partnerships together between all the, the services that are, are needed. As one of the findings is we need to increase knowledge and capacity about different healthcare conditions in a lot of community sports and service providers. And here, so Alberta is the hub uh, of, of one of these projects, BC and the Yukon are also two other demonstration sites. So we are here in Alberta, it's based out of the Glen Rose, and then we have the spoke model going out to all of the rural communities so tying into that last question about how do we better support rural Alberta so we're looking at the three populations fetal alcohol spectrum disorder autism spectrum disorder and cerebral palsy so again stay tuned as we gather more information about this other important aspect of transition
Thank you very much. And I think with that, we'll we'll wrap up. And, and I think the message uh, uh, of the day is stay tuned. Lots of great work happening in Alberta. And hopefully uh, we'll see some of this work uh, presented at least at the poster fair at the conference coming up. Some of this sounds like some great content for, for posters, uh, if not uh, on the stage. We will have a, a session at the conference on transition uh, models. But uh, uh, so, yeah, so definitely uh, do uh, consider coming to the CAFC conference in Edmonton if you want to talk more with our folks from Alberta here who have done such great work. Uh, and with that, we will wrap up. Uh, we do our we uh, webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And when you do get to watch live, you can participate in the in the comment and the discussion with your comments and questions as you saw today. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. Uh, next week, uh, on June 13th, we'll be welcoming Dr. Jim King from CHEO in Ottawa to talk about achieving epic benefits at CHEO. Good design is as good is as important as good technology, and the epic we're we're referring to there is their integrated enterprise wide e electronic medical mm -hmm. record that they've implemented. But really, the focus of that presentation is how they maximized clinician adoption uh, through the optimization of the end user experience. So making those those end users, the clinicians uh, that are involved, really see the benefit and and realize benefits from uh, an electronic uh, medical record. And then following that, again for this audience in particular, on June twentieth, our final webinar before our summer hiatus, we'll have the coach approach supporting families of children with disabilities. And this webinar is brought to you by our colleagues from Childbright. Uh, Childbright, for those of you who don't know, is a pan-Canadian network that aims to improve life outcomes for children with brain-based developmental disabilities and their families. And this presentation will showcase three research projects funded by Childbright that use a coach model at three transition points in a child's development uh, that will be highlighted. So Childbright uh, does much research on transitions, patient and family engagement, etc., cetera, uh, children with complex medical needs, etc. So uh, certainly the, the folks uh, that participated today I certainly should be interested in that webinar on June 20th. So thanks again for joining us today. Some great presentations coming up in the next couple weeks. So hopefully we will see you back here. Bye everyone.